leave it in there for very long. Mm. Pull it out. Maybe if you pasteurize the fresh ginger a little bit, I don't know if that would hurt the flavor. Um, I don't know. You know, it's, mm. it's hard to say. Peel it. <laughs> well, yeah, I think you could, though, because ginger tea, when you make it with fresh ginger, I mean, you're putting the ginger into boiling water. Yeah. Which basically pasteurizes it, so I don't yeah. see any reason it's why. way above. Yeah. yeah. Well, I don't see any reason why it wouldn't work if you did it at pasteurization, which is, what, one... 165, 165 I think? 165, yeah. And, um... You know, so I mean, when I, when I make, I do when I'm doing living history stuff. One of the things I do is I make uh, ginger ale, basically. You know, I make a I mm -hmm. make a mead, I make a um, couple of cordials, and um, I do a ginger ale because it basically gives me something to do with my hands all day long. Because I'm peeling and slicing and chopping ginger, but um, and, and you know that kind of thing. But it's you know when I t I take it home and then I bring it up to pasteurization level so it doesn't get mold on it before I let it sit. And generally what I'll do is I'll let it ferment a little bit and just turn it into a really light ginger beer, you know, just slight alcohol hmm. level. And Not it never, it doesn't wise. change the flavor at all, really, you know. Yeah. Hmm. It's a lot better than, like, dried ginger, dehydrated ginger or any of that. I'll tell you, one, you want to um, have fun with ginger, do it with candied ginger sometime. That's amazing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I do a ginger cordial with candied ginger, and it's like burn your face off ginger cordial. Oh, my God. Oh, it's amazing. <laughs> but, yeah, candied ginger is fun just because, you know, I mean, it kind of, something in the sugar concentrates the ginger flavor. I don't know what it is. Uh, all I know is I like eating candied ginger. Oh, I know. Yeah, well, I've got a girlfriend and I. We're both ginger. We're both ginger nuts, and we'll sit there and work our way through a whole can of it, you know. But um, yeah, <laughs> it's it's terrible. It's like none of it makes it into the actual ginger cordial because we're eating it. <laughs> I gave my husband some candied ginger the other day because he had a tummy ache, and he's like, "Why would you put this in my mouth?" <laughs> <laughs> no, ginger's amazing for tummy aches. Oh, oh, Tom, I have a good one for you. Uh, okay, have you ever had chocolate covered uh, candied ginger? Ooh. It's stunning. Yes. It is stunning, and it would make an amazing mead. You know, you're working with cocoa, so <laughs> just thinking. Cocoa just, ginger. Yeah. I don't know. Who would say no to chocolate ginger mead? Not too many. I don't know. Yeah, that's, James. Uh, yeah. That's you got to try it. It sounds pretty awesome. Yeah. <laughs> So there you go. If you come out with it, you have to. I get a. I, I get a four pack of that. Okay, just saying. <laughs> uh, you know, I I would be happy to put one your that your way if that comes up in something we do. Yeah, we get, <laughs> I am gonna try. Come up there and do a collab, man. That's what I'm, apparently I'm getting to do a couple of those this year. So I'm like totally excited about that, that kind of an idea. Since I'll never be commercial ever. You know, it's just not, it's not in my future, which is fine, you know. It's good. You know, you probably get more naps in. I, I do get more naps in, but uh, I also have the, I mean, I, I've always seen myself as the Barbara Walters of the meat industry, and I'm really happy with that job. I really am. Yeah. Well, now that you're AMMA. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you, you have gone pro, you just don't know it. Yeah. Yeah, well, you know, I'm just helping the pro. I'm just helping the pros get more pro, I guess. But yeah, that was never. And those was, of us who aren't get there. Yeah, there's never been in the entire twenty some odd years I've been making mead. There's never been a second where I said, "Yeah, you know, I really want to open a meadery." I basically was like, "But there's so many other people to visit and get to know and talk to and find out what they're up to and that." You know, it's like I'm having way too much fun reporting on it. But uh, <laughs> why not? Yeah. You know, somebody's got to do it. Might as well. Be well, you've mead. made a living out of it anyway. Exactly. So yeah, yeah, that's cool. Besides, I get you know free mead and and reduced <laughs> and reduced price mead, which is really really cool. <laughs> yeah, if you opened up a meadery, you'd be around your meat all the time. Yeah, and that'd be boring. I just no. <laughs> I like the variety. I, you know, I have to come up with my own ideas and everything. Uh-uh. It's much more fun going and, like, going, James, oh, my God, basil lemongrass? Really? <laughs> I need some <laughs> of that. <laughs> it's, uh, yeah, I mean, I would say after, uh, 
you know, putting out as many cans of that basil lemongrass as we have. Some variety is kind of a cool thing, you know? It is. Uh, so I'm just hoping that with our, like I said earlier, with our new space, um, you know, one of our big opportunities uh, is to, to do a little bit more of that. Yeah. You know, when you do a try, try some new stuff, put out short runs. I mean, people are going crazy for these brewery limited release things. Let's let's do some more of that. I mean, it's kind of crazy because you go to a lot of different meteries out there, and they've got a lot of different products on the shelf. But we've had to really focus what we do um, on some core ones because we just haven't had the space up until uh, recently to, to fiddle around with stuff at any kind of production level. Um, so when you, when you experiment, what do you use uh, one gallon, five gallon batches to like just when, you know, to, sometimes we'll do uh, like growler sized um, sort of, uh, you know, things that will do like an infusion or a secondary fermentation. Mm-hmm. Um, but really, I think for any kind of um, accuracy as far as like a recipe goes, a five-gallon batch to me is about the minimum right. I would want to do because it it's so hard when you're working with things like honey and spices to in a one gallon batch to hit the same taste profile a second time around uh, I feel like a recipe really needs to be in the measurements that we're working with probably in a in a five gallon batch to be accurate right yeah I would imagine that a, a one gallon batch would be too volatile uh, the changes you know small changes big difference right yeah um and that's to me one of the reasons uh you know for the viking party like if it all goes wrong we'll just <laughs> d- you know, dump it in some kegs and <laughs> deal with it later <laughs> that sounds good um yeah what other questions do you guys have since we have just a few more minutes here um well, uh, yeah, I, I, I asked this question uh, uh, last weekend, and it was, uh, it, was uh, it was about um, since you're you know you've moved into the into the into the pro uh, arena, um, and you're you've gotten exposed to all this great new equipment and stuff that you know the 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 usual home brewer doesn't usually get to see. But if um, if you had to choose. Like of this stuff that you discovered when you moved into pro, uh, this this equipment. Maybe is there something that might be able to be translated down to the home mead maker that would you know help us all make better mead if we started using this one pro piece of equipment or this one pro trick. Well, uh, from a pro trick, uh, the one thing that I. You know, having seen a lot of different people get it right and get it wrong. Um, what I mentioned earlier with uh, learning how to, you know, at least roughly test sulfite and control that in your home batches mm-hmm. so that, you know, you're not going overboard with it and having weird off sulfur flavors and taste of matches in there, which is what happens when people put too much in. Um, so thinking about sulfiting to prevent re-fermentation and oxidation. Right. Um, and also, um, you know, forget a lot of the equipment, but don't be afraid uh, to go back in and check your mead and to rack it off. Um, you know, something, if, if it's if it's an ingredient that only needs to be there for a few days. Um, I mean, as I've gone up to pro, um, I appreciate a lot of things. Um, 
like uh, filtration and um, you know temperature control. You you could build a um, use a mini fridge and a uh, and a temperature controller to control your fermentations uh, really carefully. That's a great way to take temperature control to a homebrew level. Um, mm. But I I mean ultimately I think like not getting oxidation or uh, contamination by doing something as simple as learning how to take, uh, you know, at least rough uh, sulfur dioxide measurements uh, using a using a titret, uh, which is a little uh, ampule type thing, and they're available through a lot of homebrew shops because L.D. Carlson sells them. You can probably go on Amazon and buy them and it's T I T R E T S. Uh, it's a little sulfite test. Um, it's not super accurate, but for a home brewer, it's, it's a great start. Um, you know, that's, that, that would be my recommendation offhand. Oh, cool. Pie truff. I will look into Yeah. Um, Analytical chemistry, it's all good. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I'm an accounting major. You know him. <laughs> um, what else would I say? I mean, we use a lot of different things, uh, but the the big stuff um, doesn't necessarily. You don't need pumps and big tanks to do the same stuff you do at a homebrew side. Um, what you do need is ways to prevent um, contamination or, you know, more carefully rack stuff. Um, and, um, you know, also, I think a big thing or lesson learned just from doing it over time is... Uh, kind of learn your ingredients because each one of them is going to be a little different and you can't just dump the stuff in there, uh, mm -hmm. whether in primary or secondary and expect it to taste like what you want it to. I mean, the number of people over, you know, the fall who bring me a clove mead or something right. that they've put cloves into and they've dumped mm -hmm. like half the bottle of cloves <laughs> in there. And yeah. like, Isn't uh, great? I made it. <laughs> and, like I really I admire the excitement, but um, I, I think the best way to improve is by kind of experimenting and trying it out, and maybe racking off you know cloves a little bit earlier if you want to. You know, um, you're like, man, that's getting pretty clovey. I'll you know, leave that stuff in there and I'll rack the meat off off the top of it into another carboy and protect it with a little CO2 and a little, you know, sulfite and then we'll add whatever other ingredients we want to do, you know, by not um, creating a, a, you know, a failure source or something when you do that by treating the meat kind of carefully. Um, I think you know, that'll put you, set you up for a really big win, um, as you're, uh, as you're going through, uh, sort of a, you know, carboy level of, um, right. Experimentation and mead making. Yeah. For, for me, temp temperature control was the big, uh, was the big, uh, step up. Uh, yeah. Uh, made a big and difference. And I haven't gotten if you're not yet. doing, uh, <laughs> degassing and nutrient additions that's also something to, um, like staggered nutrient additions uh, that's also something to look at because meat is just so um, sort of fickle from a yeast happiness standpoint that y you can't just let it um, hang out and do its thing you know, a lot of people use aging on lees or with still with a little bit of active yeast in it to clean up off flavors. Uh -huh. um, 
but if you really do a clean fermentation for